Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. Got beautiful blue skies out there, a little bit of a breeze, nice and sunny. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful morning it is. And if you're online with us here this morning, be sure to tell us in the notes in there that you're with us. Uh, say hi so we know you're there. And uh, we got lots of stuff coming up this, uh, well, actually coming up through the month of July mostly. Um, but this Wednesday at 7 p.m., we're going to go ahead and continue on into a deep dive with our uh, engagement project. And this is tour eight out of nine. So we're almost at the very, very end. Um, and this one here, uh, we will be setting out boxes of, of tissues with because it is, it is a very emotional one. And, it, and it's a very hard hitting one. It's probably one of the hardest ones out of all of the tours that we've had so far, but well, well, well worth it. And so Pastor Terry's gonna give us a preview of tour eight this morning in the message. And then we wrap up next week with tour nine already amazing so after that following that, that up then uh, we are going to start up the Bible mini series then of the 10 part mini series from the History Channel called the Bible and that starts uh, up with the message on the 7th and then the study starts on July 10th uh, and this should be an awesome study as well uh, and it's it's a follow-up to the movie that we watched, and they're both over there on the shelf, so I'm looking at them right now. Uh, but it's a, it's a very good look at Jesus' ministry, uh, compelling look at the ministry of Jesus when he was here. Then, then, if you're ready for this, on Saturday, July 6th, we're going to have a doubleheader. I have to use a baseball metaphor because, you know, it is tis the season. At 9 o'clock in the morning, we're going to have our men's breakfast. Uh, here in the morning, and it's going to be that ever-changing menu. So I asked this morning in here, I didn't get any feedback. So I'm thinking um, it's, it's going to be Cook's Choice that day. So uh, we're going to have, uh, yeah, be, beware. <laughs> uh, we're going to have a good discussion and a really good time for all. Uh, if you ever want, on the back table back there, we do have you know, the devotions, because we have a devotion each time, and those are there. And then any of our other specialty papers, and yes, I did remember, yes, it's typed up, and yes, it's on the back table for the uh, words of love in Greek in the back. So we're having a double header, so that's the morning and the afternoon then. We're going to be having a private wedding ceremony here for Carrie Santello and Shane Block, which is Diane, or Denise and Steve's daughter. So, uh, and then there's going to be a reception afterwards, and um, yeah, so it should be a, a really great time. Following that, the next week, then, we have uh, Orange Track Racing in here. And so uh, we're going on, and, and we're, hard to believe, halfway through the season of Orange Track Racing already. This year, this just seems to be really flying by for some odd reason, so... And then, coming up on July 27th, July 27th, will be our next movie night, right here at Gray Street Church. What we're planning to do is a movie called Ordinary Angels, which just came out of the theaters here uh, two weeks ago. And uh, so that is a true story, and it centers on uh, a young hairdresser from Kentucky, and she finds a complete renewed purpose in her life as he uh, meets with a widowed father and he's working really hard to take care of his two daughters and then they find out that his youngest daughter then is critically ill and needing a liver transplant. And she rallies behind it, even though she's not part of the family, she rallies behind in an effort to save that young girl's life. And so it is based on a true story. It's an absolutely wonderful uh, wonderful message, and it's not through done through the regular channels, which is kind of different today. But uh, today's worship then is going to be posted up. We'll be posting up a link back there for that today, and uh, so we got lots of great stuff coming up. That fills up the month of July every week, <laughs> so we're going to be very very busy up here. Uh, so then we need to jump into the call to worship this morning. But let's have a word of prayer to start the time of worship, shall we? 
Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together to be blessed by your word in, in the message today and in the music also that uh, was chosen for today. Lord, we thank you that we have this opportunity to gather here freely and openly in your name and that we are here to worship you. So we just center our hearts on you today. Fill us full of the Holy Spirit in here today. Speak to our minds. Speak to our hearts. Open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive that message so that we might live it out each and every day. And as Pastor Terry comes to give the message this morning, we just ask that you would overwhelm him with blessings as well so he can be powerful in the delivery of his message for you. We praise you and thank you in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So for our call to worship this morning, uh, Pastor Terry has chosen Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, and this comes from the New King James Version. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with his might through his spirit in the inner man. Bring the Holy Spirit to us, that in Christ we might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, might be able to comprehend with all the saints what the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And we know that being full, filled with the fullness of God means to have that shalom is that exactly what they're talking about in there. So here Paul is telling that church in Ephesus the true meaning of the love of God. And that is for us to extend that love to, of Christ to one another then. We must be able to comprehend the love of Christ and the depth of the sacrifice that he made. Well, see, in order to do that then, we must comprehend the amount of sin that he was atoning for on the cross. Have you ever thought about it that way? In order to understand the depth of his love, we have to understand that depth of the sin, the amount of sin that he was atoning for. And as Pastor Terry and I were discussing this week, I had told him uh, that I, of a thought that I had about that. And if we can't recognize the breadth and depth of our own sins, then we cannot understand the breadth and depth of love that it took to overcome those sins on the cross. Now multiply that by the generations, and it becomes incomprehensible. And this is what he's talking about in verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. We have no ability in our humanness to understand the breadth and the depth and the height of that forgiveness, of that atonement of those sins. He is praying that the church will be able to comprehend the incomprehensible, the love of God through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Do we and can we comprehend? That's what this is all about. So he's talking to the church, the people in Ephesus saying, hey, do you understand what a great thing, what a massive thing, that Christ undertook on the cross. Two or eight is going to be a tearjerker. I'll just give that to you. Gracious God, we just ask that you would open our hearts right now. We ask that you would open our minds and just take away any barriers there is to worship to you today. We thank you, Lord, for the calling that you put on our hearts to learn more about you, to learn more about your word, to learn more about your love and your goodness. We thank you that you've enabled Dr. Tackett to bring these studies forth to us here and that we are able to share those out so people have a great understanding of who you really are, the nature of God, and to stare into that nature and understand it. We praise you and thank you in these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you were praying, Mark, all I could think of was this generation of teachers that 
we have gone to, whether it's Max or Dr. Tackett or um, Dr. Jeremiah, time's marching on. And in addition to your prayer, I would pray that the Lord would raise up more people, more men and women like them. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day outside. Got to drive here with the windows down, cool air blowing through my face. But all that, compared to what we're about to embark on here this morning and then again on Wednesday night, that's really light stuff. So I do invite you to proverbially buckle up because as Mark said, this is a challenging and not so much challenging uh, to say the words, but challenging to take the words and ingest them and, and to understand them and to live by them. Because this, this, especially once we get to Wednesday night, because all I can do is give you a high overview of this, because I, you don't want to sit here for an hour and a half with <laughs> me this morning. But, it's going to challenge you in the way that you look at life, the way that you walk your life. Now, one thing that we are blessed with, and some people think it's a detriment, I see it as a blessing, is that many Bibles have titles for the different sections, or what is called a percopy in each book. This morning's call to worship is no different. And depending on the translation, there are a few different examples of this. So in the New King James Version, which is the version Mark read from this morning, it, this section is called the Appreciation of the Mystery. Uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which I don't know if all of you have heard of that one, but it's a mouthful, um, is Prayer for Spiritual Power. The ESV is Prayer for Spiritual Strength. And then the NLT is Paul's Prayer for Spiritual Growth. And each one of these, in their own way, when you read that passage and, and study it, do fall into it. But no matter how we try, or no matter what words we use, there's no way in our finite minds that we can truly understand how much God loves us and what this sacrifice took. In this passage this morning, Paul prays that by love and faith, we would be able to comprehend the width, the length, the depth, the height of Christ's love. And there's many, many times in the Bible where God provides us measurements. In Genesis 6, the Lord tells us Noah to build an ark, saying the ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Exodus 25 through 27, the Lord tells Moses the measurements for the Ark of the Covenant, the table, the lampstand, the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering, and the courtyard. In 1 Kings 6, it tells us that the temple Solomon built was 60 cubits long, 20 wide, and 30 high. Each of these structures were tangible places where God's presence could be found. Revelation 21, John is shown the new Jerusalem and in verses 15 and 17, it says, the angel who talked with me had, measuring, had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. Now, y'all are going, um, we do inches and feet here. Other places use centimeters and meters. Let's look at that. A stadia is equivalent to about 1,380 miles. 144 cubits is about 216 feet. So it was 1380 by 1380 by 1380 miles 
and the walls were 216 feet deep. So I thought, hmm, let's get some more perspective on that. So if you were to draw a straight line from Phoenix to Chicago, it would be approximately 1,450 miles. Satellites in low orbit can go up to about 1,243 miles. And the International Space Station, which we've all heard about, is only about 249 miles away. You can't see it with the naked eye. This is massive. And when I was reading it and thinking about it and all these measurements, all I could think of was 70 times 7. <clears throat> when Jesus told us to forgive 70 times 7, he was telling us we need to forgive endlessly. Now, the new Jerusalem that represents God basically tells me if it's, if it's like that, that God can't be contained. Now, any of you who ever as a kid lay down in the grass and just stare up into the night sky? Mm -hmm. So I did this after being told that the universe was infinite. It was never ending. And I must have been seven, eight years old. And I'm looking up into the sky and my head hurt because I could not fathom that it just kept going and going and going. Now, we'll never know this side of heaven, but for me, staring up into the night sky, to this day, still makes my head spin. And trying to understand that infinite nature is beyond my comprehension. So then we put God into that, and he is infinite. Same thing. It's behind our in in comprehension. So with today, as we keep moving forward, we're moving into the epic of engagement, or from engagement to, excuse me, redemption. It's gonna be like trying to understand infinite space. This epic is not easy. Now, remember the waiver from Tour One? If you were, have seen the video with Dr. Tackett, he reads off this waiver. And it says, we, the undersigned, do acknowledge there is danger here in the presence of God and that gazing upon his face is not easy. We understand we can lose ourselves and promise that we will not run away from the face of God. Danger, not easy. People run from things like that that have nothing to do with God. So he put this out there and eventually in... in the, uh, the eighth video, he does say, and I have signed this too. And as I prepared for the message this week, I read that over, I can't tell you how many times, because this is, this is danger. We've been told to pray boldly, but be prepared to receive what you're praying for. This goes beyond that. All of the talk about understanding the measurements and the distance is simply a metaphor to help us to get ready. And today, and then in more depth on Wednesday, we're going to dig deeper into understanding what God has truly done for each of us. The depth of his agape <laughs> love for each and every one of us is beyond our comprehension. One of the mistakes that some make is that we think that we're not lovable by anyone, especially by God. How can God, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, ever-present, and so much more, love and care about little old me? In the grand scheme of eternity, I'm but a speck. But he cares. It's been said that we cannot love others if we do not love ourselves. There's truth. Others think so highly of themselves that they think that they don't need as much forgiveness as others might. Oh, I'm better than that person. I don't need 
And, and you might not say it out loud. You might not even say the words, but the inference is there in their mind. The measurements are not just for height, width, length, and depth. They're also how we rank things and people. We do this even without thinking about it. Right now, the big thing with ranking is, where's Caitlin Clark on the all-star voting? <laughs> ranking is nothing new. Putting someone above someone else or putting yourself above someone else is nothing new. In Luke 18, Jesus teaches us the parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. And in this parable, we have a tax collector who, as we all know from previous teachings, is about like the dirt on the bottom of the gum on the bottom of your shoe. I mean, they're the lowest of the low because they have gone against everything that their people held dear and they are working for the Romans, taking their money and making a profit for themselves. So here's the story Jesus tells him. So says, then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, another example comes earlier in Luke chapter 7. And this is when Jesus goes to the home of a Pharisee to have dinner. Let's look at this, starting at verse 36. This is one of the Pharisees asked Jesus, to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And when a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. His tears fell on his feet and she wiped them with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, Think back to the Pharisee in the previous parable. If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is such a sinner. <clears throat> now, remember that they don't sit at the table like we do like this. They literally would be down and having their legs off to the side, kind of laying and sitting. So when she was at his feet, she was literally, she wasn't like under the table or hiding anywhere. She was out in the open. And during most of the conversation, as, you, as we hear here and we'll get into more, Jesus ignores her. Like she's not even there. And I got to imagine that was pretty difficult considering she was crying on his feet, wiping his feet with her hair, and then she ultimately would anoint him his feet with oil. She, like the tax collector in the previous parable, she knew her sin. She knew what she had done. Simon, on the other hand, well, he needed to be taught a little bit because he failed to understand that sin is sin. There's no ranking system in God's <laughs> eyes. Let's pick this up at verse 40. When then it's, uh, Jesus answered his thoughts, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? 
Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. See, in this teaching, Jesus is using two people who've been forgiven various amounts. And he asked Simon who he thought would love the lender more. And he answered correctly, the one forgiven the larger debt. So here comes the teaching that Simon really needs to hear. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. These were simple courtesies to provide a guest with water to wash their dusty sandaled feet. That was just common hospitality. Greeting that guest with a kiss and oil for their head were signs of warmth and friendliness. Simon didn't do any of that. It was an uninvited, sinful woman who showed that hospitality to Jesus. And in verse 47, Jesus says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who's forgiven little only shows little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Motives. And I got to thinking about that and I thought, what are your motives for going to church? Why do you come to church on Sunday? Why do you come on Wednesday? Why do you come to events? Why do you read your Bible? What's your motive for praying or serving others? Is it to make you feel good? Is it to pump yourself up? Say, look what I did. Is it to get something out of it for yourself? Yeah, I know at work, if I go on to a special spot in a website for employees, I can go to a page and it's a volunteer page and I can put in hours of what I did. And it's like, it's not why I do the volunteer work that I do. So I usually, I leave it blank. I let somebody else have that. Mm -hmm. Now we can only guess Simon's motives. Yeah, when we do it for our own benefit, for what we can get out of it. We've lost sight of how much we have been forgiven. When we sin, regardless of what it is, we are going against the will of God. Do you think that you've been forgiven little? When we do not love others, this is hard to we are thinking very little of God's love for us. Let me say that again. When we do not love others, we are thinking very little of God's love for us. Now think back to this sinful woman. Now forgiven. What was she? She was repentant. But she was also bold. Because you don't you didn't go just go to a Pharisee's house uninvited. She not only was uninvited, but she was maybe a step above a tax collector, maybe considered equal with the tax collector in the way that they saw their sin. It's the depth of her faith and belief that she needed Jesus' forgiveness that we're looking at here. They were well beyond what many people's understanding of God's saving grace is. She wholeheartedly believed that Jesus not only could, but that he would forgive her. We often think that 
Jesus might do this for us, or God might do this for us. She believed with every ounce of her being that Jesus would. Simon believed that he was above the need for forgiveness. It took that teaching. I mean, in 1 John 4, 10 and 11, it tells us what real love is. It says that this is real love, that not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. And then in verse 19, it says, we love each other because he loved us first. So if we don't love others, we're thinking little of God's love for us. Throughout the Bible, we read about God's people turning from him. This week, I've been reading about Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Now, Jeroboam was promised the ten tribes if he would follow God's word, if he would do what he was asked to do. And yet... Just like the Egyptian, uh, like the Israelites in the desert after they left Egypt, he formed two calves, put them in two places, said, "Oh, go here and worship them. You don't have to go to Jerusalem." He turned from God. How much do you have to hate God to turn away from Him? Kind of goes to what I, and the the story about uh, Penn. And of uh, Penn and Teller last week, he said, how much do you have to hate God to not proselytize or tell other people about him? Yet, and you all know this, but God still loves us regardless. Now he could easily just stop everything. In the garden, Adam and Eve ate the fruit, he just said, I'm done. And stopped it. But he loved his creation. So instead, we go from one garden to another. We go from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I personally know, because I have kids, I know what it's like when one of the kids doesn't do what you tell them to do or they do something wrong. That's one child. Okay, maybe you have a, a small baseball team in your family. You might have, you know, six, eight, some have families, have a lot of kids. But even at that rate, God feels that way. Not just the one time that we mess up, every <coughs> single time. We sin. He feels that. Now, take that and multiply it by billions. There's over 7 billion people on the planet right now. Just in this moment. Go back to Adam and Eve and add up all the people. So now we're talking about, you know, Sands on the on the shore. It's going to be more than that. I mean, it's that's an immense number that we can't even. It's like infinity. It's hard to comprehend what it is. But God has felt that from every single person, every time they've sinned, from Adam and Eve until well, eternity. Because he hasn't stopped it. We haven't gotten to the point where Jesus has returned. Can you imagine the anguish? And we talked about the two gardens. Well, let's go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Where we learn of Jesus' anguish. Matthew 26, starting at verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. 
Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And I stopped there for just a moment. Have you ever had a moment where you were suffering and you were <coughs> didn't know what to do and, and you were on your knees? Maybe you weren't a believer at the time, so you had nobody to go to, but maybe you were and you praying out to God and crying out to God. That anguish, now multiply that, amplify that beyond our comprehension. That is where Jesus is at this moment. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is weak, but the, or the spirit is willing, but the body is Weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep, have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, ah, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Now I realize this has been a long day for the disciples. And you know how you feel when it's a hard, long day. You're tired at the end of it as well. Well, Jesus was too. He was in human form. He was tired as well. They didn't yet know the sacrifice that Jesus was about to make. Now, he had given them clues as to what was coming, but it hadn't registered yet. The thing is, is we do know. We now know. And yet, we still sin. <coughs> Are we that apathetic towards Jesus' sacrifice? Have we gotten to the point now where, oh yeah, there's the cross. Yeah, he, he, he was nailed to it at one point. Has it gotten to the point where it's just like anything else you do during the day, you get up, you brush your teeth, you get ready. Have you just made it something you know and you don't truly think about each and every day and understand what he did? I sometimes wonder if we put such a distance between ourselves and what he did that everything is just watered down. It's diminished. Jesus' agony as he prayed was not about what he was about to endure. Although in his humanness, it could, that's, not unheard of, but it wasn't what he was agonizing about. Isaiah 52 describes what the Roman torture would leave Jesus looking like. It was a torture beyond human endurance. It was a torture that I don't know if I could have lived through it. But that's not what caused his agony. And it wasn't the crucifixion either. I love when Dr. Tackett said this in the video. It wasn't the crucifixion. If it had been, we would have had a full description of the crucifixion. Instead, Scripture just simply says they crucified him. That's another clue that it's not what caused Jesus' is agony. And it's not just our sin. 
what would cause the agony was the separation. Matthew 27, 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's in that moment that Jesus experienced the horrible abandonment from God the Father as he paid our debt. Many of you have been abandoned by a friend. Many of you have been in a relationship that fell apart and now maybe there's just something in there that you've lost something and you agonize over it. It makes you feel awful. It's still nothing like the abandonment that Jesus would feel as he paid our debt. God poured out his wrath on Jesus for the sins of every single person from Adam and Eve into eternity. And not just a single payment for each one of those, but multiple payments each time we sin. That's past, present, future. And we know that Jesus has been God with God since eternity. And then he wasn't. He was with him. Again, we can't understand, we can't fathom eternity. But then he wasn't. He was separated from God. Dr. Tackett asked the question in our upcoming study on Wednesday night, how long did the separation last? And between watching this video umpteen times, <laughs> preparing and, and Mark and I sitting down on Monday night. And then came up with the question, how long did Jesus' agony last? These two questions might have the same answer. But they may have different ones. Since Jesus has been with God since eternity, we know he was there in the garden. He, along with the Holy Spirit, who has been with God since eternity, were all there when they ate the apple. Dr. Tackett talks more about the separation piece but I got pulled in a slightly different direction. Where did Jesus' agony start? I have to believe it was in the Garden of Eden. And to me, this gives an altogether new meaning to his words in John 15, 13, when he tells us, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. If it started in the Garden of Eden, that means Jesus has been laying down his life for each and every one of us ever since. And from Scripture, we know that Jesus is the beginning and the end. In Revelation 21, 6, and this is from the uh, Brarian Standard Bible, it says, And he told me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give freely from the spring of the water of life. And it tells us that Jesus was with God from eternity and will be with God to eternity. To this day and until Jesus returns, he is interceding for us with the Father. Yet every time, and I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself, Every time I sin, I have to wonder if those same words come to mind. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Each time we sin, we are creating separation. Dr. Tackett says, and I wholeheartedly agree that if he, meaning Jesus, had not said this or had not asked this question, it could be argued that he didn't pay the price for our sins. If Jesus had not, then just as John wept in Revelation 5, because there was no one in heaven or earth with, who was able to open and read the sealed scroll. Then an elder said to John, not, don't we? He says, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne has won the victory. And then in verse six, it goes on to say, then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the twelve or the twenty-four elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. Those seals the Lamb of God, who appeared slaughtered. So Jesus is in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, but from this, I, I, he's still bearing the scars that he showed to the disciples. That Thomas said, I have to see the holes in his hands and touch the hole in his side. He still bears the scars of our sin from the moment that he was crucified to eternity. We will see what we did to Jesus when we go to heaven. I don't know about you, but that hurts. Nobody likes to see the scars that they leave behind. <laughs> I've seen, I, and I'm no better than anyone else. Mark and I both told you that. Doesn't, just because we stand up here and teach doesn't make us better than anyone. But we have done things and we have said things that have left scars on people. And when I look back at how those people reacted or how they felt from that or the damage that it did to that relationship, I grieve. That causes me agony. Jesus is bearing our scars forever. He was and he is still willing to be forsaken so that we don't have to be. It is because of his agape hesed love that he went through with it. Going back to 15, 13, John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. I see Jesus had extended the privilege of being friends to all believers. Something that, if we look at the Old Testament, there's only two. Abraham and Moses were extended that, to be friends of God. So then we have to back up one verse to verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This agape has of love means that we are to compassionately, righteously, responsibly, and sacrificially seek the well-being of others. Well, Jesus teaches that too. Jesus tells us that we're to love our enemies. So to have this kind of love, to have this kind of love for others, means that we may not like them, but we are to love them. 
See, Jesus might not have liked all the people or the things that people did for sin, but he still loved them. You might not like somebody for something that they have done to you or they've done to others or words that they've spoken, but we're still to love them. Sacrificial love, which we have talked about over and over again, and it's on the list that Mark's printed off back there on the table, so grab a copy on your way out. If you need one, we can print more. We know the printer. This sacrificial love is what Jesus modeled for us. This is part of the reason he came was to show us how to do it. And then he commands us to do it. God will always come for you. Parable of the lost sheep, prodigal son, he always will come for us. So why don't you do that for others? Love is not something that we choose to do when it's convenient for us. Is something that must be done continually, just as Christ has done and continues to do for us each and every moment of every day. More so, and I thank God for all the things that he gives us, including these kind of lessons. This lesson hit me more than any sermon or any Bible study or any reading that I think I have ever done. Because it made me look at myself and what I did to cause that separation from God. And now the, the one thing you gotta be careful of here is that the thief, Satan, He's going to stick his foot in that door so he can go, you did all that and you are not worthy. You are worthy of God's love. Don't let Satan get into your head and re try to remind you of all the things that you've done in the past that caused that separation because it is Christ's agape, hesed love that you are made righteous with God wasn't nails. It was that agape, passive love that kept him on the cross. Father, as we digest this message, we thank you that you didn't give up on us in the very beginning and that you have pursued us and continue to pursue us until eternity. And Father, I know what I have caused in that separation between you and your son. And I'm sorry. I know I'm going to mess up again. And I'm sorry. I don't want to cause any more separation. Father, continue to work in my life, in all of our lives, by the power of the Holy Spirit to be a blessing in your kingdom. And let each and everything that we do and say be an example of your love for your people that other people will see. And Father, I pray that they would want that hope as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into this time of communion this morning, I'm going to again call you and remind you, because this is the time where we're supposed to remember what Christ has done for us. And until we fully understand it, as I said earlier, unless we understand the true depth of what was done, uh, we 
ran into some friends yesterday that we used to have a music ministry with, and one of the songs that we sang was uh, penned by uh, some people here out of Cedar Rapids called the Marshalls. Uh, and they have a group, and they go around and sing. But she wrote a song, uh, and it was One Cross. And one of these days we're going to sing that song. But it's One Cross, Three Nails, Forgiven. And when we think about that, when, when we were singing the song, it really made a, meant a lot to me. It really speaks to my heart. But as we come into this time, you know, we think about the sins. We think about our sins. We think about the sins of the world. We think about the sins of the generation that held Jesus to the cross because while we were yet sinners, God sent his son to die for us, for those sins. Those sins held him to the cross out of love, a love that we can't comprehend. We can't fathom the depth of that love. And yet, he went to the cross willingly for us. Now it said while he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane that he was sweating and drips of blood was coming from him. That was the depth of his anguish. In Psalms it tells us he was so disfigured by the torturous beating that he took place in the crucifixion that he could barely be recognized. That was a portent of what was to come 700 years later after that was written. So we are called to do our part and to remember Christ as participating in communion here as we do each and every week, as we gather together. Because this was a sacrifice like no other has been or ever will be. And it was made for you and it was made because we are yet sinners. So, at some point in time, the light has to come on. That aha moment where we go, yeah, this was a big deal. This was a big deal. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread <laughs> and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take it. Later on in the meal, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. This is how we participate in that sacrifice that God made for us. Sending his son Jesus to atone for our sins that we commit each and every day. Thanks be to God. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. So as we come into this time of prayer today, I like to lift up those friends. We ran into them yesterday at the store. And right now they're living out of their motor home. Uh, they go down in winter down in Arizona. And in the middle of the winter, the furnace quit. The pipes froze in their house and flooded their entire house. When I say the entire house, three stories flooded so this is coming up on July this happened last winter January In January <coughs> they have to gut the entire house and start all over in the midst of all this Terry um, she had congenitive heart failure and was sitting at the table and just kind of rolled back and she had four heart attacks now she's got a pacemaker in. Uh, she has a hard time speaking. They have <laughs> been through hell on her this year. <clears throat> My heart breaks for them because they are such devout Christians. And it's a true reminder that no matter who you are, 
you're not going to escape the problems. But God will bring you through it. I said, you have to tell us this stuff so that we can pray for you, so that we can help you through. We can pray you through what you're going through. And she started to cry. That's the asset of love. A steadfast love that endures forever. That's what asset means that sanctifying, sacrificial love, this agape love. And when you do that together, a hesed agape love, it endures forever. That's what we're called to do for our neighbors and our friends. I just want to share that with you before you come up for prayers. Terry and Bill McVenda. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. So again, it's prayers for the people. And if there's any other prayers that we would ask for. We went affected by the bad weather and storms lately. Yep. I have that on here. Prayers. Yes, yes, okay. All right, Father God, we come to you this morning with love and honor to praise your holy name for all that you do for us each and every day. You are the air that we breathe. You wake us up each day that we can see the beauty of this earth that you have created for us to enjoy. You give us strength when we are weak. You give us vision and clarity of mind. You protect us from the evil one. You give us hope for the future. You guide us through the darkest times in our lives. You are always with us. You will never leave us. You gave us your Holy Spirit to guide us through the wilderness of life. You do this for all who trust in you and read your word. As in Proverbs 35, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. In Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. And I pray that for, for Mark's friends, Terry and Bill. Father God, just be with them constantly through this trial that they are in. It shows that you have been with them. You've given them shelter and food, and you've taken care of them. Guide them in their paths, Lord Jesus, and help them to rebuild better than they were before, Father God. And Father God, in these troubled times, it is easy to be dismayed. Through fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, prices rising on everything, health concern and loss for loved ones. But you say those that call on the name of the Lord will be saved and we will be comforted through the storms of this life. For you are Yahweh El Roy, the God who sees us. We ask that you see that a new Louisiana law was put into effect to put your 10 commandments back into every public school classroom. I ask that it spread like a wildfire across this nation to bring you back into our children's and grandchildren's lives, to learn about you and to walk in your ways. We need a revival of hearts and minds all across America, Father God, and all nations of this earth, for you are, you alone are God. There is no other. Let us be a fearless nation who move and act to do your will and not our own. Help us to love one another as you have taught us to do. And Father God, I lift up Chloe and Brayden for healing, continued healing from the viruses that have been attacking them. Please remove it in Jesus' name. Take the fever away from Brayden, Father God, and do not let this virus attack his body. In Jesus' holy name, I ask that. I lift up Terry's coworker, Lori, for broken bones. Father, I ask that you fuse them back together perfectly so that she will be healed correctly. Bring caregivers that will comfort her through this trial she is in. Bring comfort, food, and shelter for our homeless, Father God, and guide them through their lives each and every day. And Father God, I ask for those here and online that are fighting cancer or viruses that your perfect will for their lives would be to heal them. I ask that you walk with them daily. Bring them the care that they need. 
I pray, Father, that they will see your divine love in their lives as they go through their trials. Help us to love one another as you love us. Help us to walk in your ways of everlasting. Help us to show your, your fruits of the Spirit and to have an answer to help those that are lost to bring them back to you. Let us be your hands and feet to those in need. We thank you for your love, Jesus. For you are God Almighty, El Shaddai. For you are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we praise and thank you, Father, for all you do for us. I don't remember what Diane and I were doing yesterday, but she made a comment about her children and her grandchildren and the world that they are growing up in. All we can do is take care of what God has given us to take care of. God has given you to Mark and I. You have been given to your children and their children to them. It's my prayer that as we leave today that you really think about what caused that separation, what caused that anxiety, what caused or that ag agony. And that it helps you to change the way you view life and the way you live your life and that you it points you straight to God each and every moment of each and every day. Father, I pray that we leave this place today. That the words that you teach us, whether it's through a message like today or a Bible study, through our daily reading, or someone speaking truth into our lives. Father, that it would be something that helps us to understand just a small portion of the agony that we have caused, the separation that we caused and that we would change by the power of the Holy Spirit to live lives that bring hope to others, that show you through each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>